Hey, what's up guys, Phil's Two Cents here, and today we're gonna to be checking out AMD's latest Radeon Adrenaline Driver 24.1.1. And it comes with AMD's driver level integration of frame generation technology, also known as AMD Fluid Motion Frames. So yeah, today I'm gonna to be showing you how to enable it in the driver, how it's gonna be performing with our 6700 XT. I decided to pick a mid-range-ish card from the last generation just to see how adding frame generation tech to an older mid-range card would um, affect this performance. And then we're gonna talk about its quirks and features, I guess, like a Doug DeMiro video, because there's a few caveats to know and learn about AMD fluid motion frames. So let's get right into it after we pay some bills. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. No, we interrupt this interruption with this interruption about new stuff from iFixit. Wish you had a new graphics card, but inventory sucks. Fix the inventory problems with iFixit. Whoa, don't drop it. Can't fix that with iFixit. Just kidding, yes you can. Wish you could take iFixit with you anywhere, but your pockets aren't big enough. Introducing the new Moray. And the new Nino. Take them with you anywhere. So get iFixit for your loved ones, or just get them for yourself. This is our 2021 Radeon RX 6700 XT. Sorry, I had to make the Doug DeMuro joke. Um, this is the card that I'm gonna be using for testing, but it does support for desktops all 6000 and 7000 series AMD GPUs. As far as mobile goes, um, they do say that they support the 700M series laptop GPUs, as well as the 7040 series, which I think the most popular ones is 7840U. Those also include a 700 series GPU uh, for mobile. Now technically handhelds with the Z1, including the Ally and the Legion Go, um, do support the driver if you manually install the driver for the Radeon 780M. Um, I can report that, yeah, it, it works totally fine on my Ally, but Again, it's not as plug and play as a desktop graphics card where you're already going to be updating the driver. So there's a few asterisks on the handheld side of things, but um, a quick YouTube search will show you a tutorial on how to install the driver manually. Okay, so how do you enable AMD Fluid Motion Frames? Um, first, you wanna make sure that you're on driver version 24.1.1. That is the latest one that they just released that includes AFMF. You'll know you're on the right driver because when you go to the hotkeys page, you'll see a hotkey for uh, toggling AMD fluid motion frames. Another useful toggle is to keep the Radeon performance overlay enabled. Third party apps will not show you the correct FPS once you enable AFMF because uh, since it's happening on the driver level after the game has already processed the frames, um, things like MSI Afterburner or EVGA Precision, other things that give you an OSD or sensor panel, that sort of stuff, they won't be reporting the correct uh, frame rate. The control panel also lets you toggle it on in more of a permanent fashion for a specific game. So once you're done with your tweaking and you found out that you know you like AFMF enabled in whatever game, say Cyberpunk or something like that, you can also go into the control panel, enable it for that game, and it'll always be on without you having to toggle it with the hotkey. We're running at Cyberpunk 2077 in ray tracing medium settings. I wanted to give the 6700 XT a pretty decent load, but I didn't want it to be sub 60-ish FPS. That's one of the first kind of quirks about this. If, if your game is already rendering less than 60 FPS, frame generation is probably not going to help it as much. It's mostly for getting games that are running in like the 60 to 90 range to feel a lot closer to your monitors, 120 or 144 Hertz. You can bump it up a little bit more up there so that it just visually looks smoother. Um, latency starts to be a little bit of a weird like it feels a little weird. Some people can handle more latency than others. But yeah, um, around 60 or lower FPS, if you do enable frame gen of any type, even on a NVIDIA card with a DLSS 3 frame gen, the latency is going to be noticeable. In these slow-mo shots, you can see the amount of latency when I move the mouse compared to when the screen actually reacts um, with frame gen on and off. Adding the list of weird quirks, AMD has decided to automatically disable frame gen if a large visual change is detected. Basically, if you whip the mouse and do a 180 real quick, for those frames in which the, the character, your camera or whatever is turning 180 degrees, frame gen will actually disable itself because the visual difference between the frames is too large. And so what that leads to is a little bit of unexpected behavior because the times in which you are moving your mouse very quickly and precisely are the times in which you would also notice visually how smooth the, uh, the output is. It has this weird thing where it feels smooth only when you're only moving the camera a little bit, I guess it's probably to make quick mouse movements, even though you're not getting as many frames, the latency will be lower because you're not inserting those generated frames. And so 
I'm guessing their idea was make the latency low for quick, fast movements so that they're accurate, and then resume frame gen again once the scene has settled, then add that smoothness. So I think my conclusion as far as what types of games are suited for this, again, you can enable it on any DirectX 11 or DirectX 12 game that can run in full screen. That's a super cool thing is that like they let you play around with it and, and mess around with it. Even on the Ally, there were a lot of times where say Elite Dangerous, um, I had enabled it and it felt worse than if I had disabled it and just ran with it, rendering at whatever frame rate it was on the uh, VRR display. So there are some games in which the, the penalty for adding frame gen will be worse than the extra um, generated frames can give you. And so you'll get perceived worse smoothness with it on. So you're gonna have to do your own testing with each types of games. But I think third person adventure type games, stuff that you could play with a controller, racing games sort of, although I don't know how bad the latency is going to be an issue for that sort of stuff. Or something like Flight Sim actually has been a good experience on the Ally with uh, frame gen because there's not there's not a lot of crazy uh, visual changes going on very quickly in that game. I was pretty hyped for this technology when, uh, when it was announced because of how good DLSS 3's frame generation felt. I was messing around with it a lot in Cyberpunk, especially with path tracing where even modern GPUs can struggle a fair amount just to render a playable frame rate. And the behavioral difference between uh, DLSS frame gen and AFMF is DLSS frame gen will stay on all the way down to, geez, I've seen it still working down to 20 FPS. And yes, the frames look really obviously interpolated, but it felt smoother in the consistency way. It kind of leads to AFMF feeling a little bit rougher uh, versus DLSS frame gen, but you can enable it on any game, but you won't have to worry about the game developer having to integrate it. You might be wondering, because FSR 3 does implement AMD's own frame generation, is there a difference between that? And yes, if the game integrates FSR 3 along with frame generation, it's going to take that regular frame gen algorithm and it's going to be able to add things like motion vector hinting from the engine itself and occlusion and all that sort of stuff where the engine can specify, okay, this object is in front of this object. Okay, cool, I can clean up that edge when I, when I generate that frame. Or, okay, this object is moving in this exact direction and so it'll probably be blurred about this much. Cool, I can take that into account and use that to create the interpolated frames that are more accurate than what you would get from the driver level thing. But it is so awesome to just see that option of any DirectX 11 or 12 game, any 6000 or 7000 series, basically RDNA 2 and up and DirectX 11 and up. Like that is so freaking cool of AMD to just be like, yeah, here's the feature, play around with it. If you, you know, if you end up with a doper experience in a game that you play, then enable it in the control panel. Then you can set it, forget it, and then, you know, be running on the latest technology, which is freaking cool. Another kind of caveat is again, um, no official support for handhelds and custom chips like Z, like the Z1 Extreme, which has just always been a thing with AMD. They've always kind of neglected their weird custom chip partners and APUs and mobile stuff because those custom chips are still using, at least the Z1 is still using a Radeon 780M as its GPU inside of its APU. Yeah, you can just manually install the driver. So that's, it's a small issue, but yeah, it would be nice to, for AMD to treat its uh, custom chip chips as like a first party kind of uh, treatment. But yeah, you can't get mad at any sort of free technology that adds frame rate to your game. I mean, like it's cool that they give you the hotkey to toggle it on and off. There's literally just like zero risk. It's just open your game, play around with it. And if you like how it feels, you think it feels better then just enable it in the control panel. So yeah, if you guys have had any experiences with AFMF or DLSS 3 frame gen, have any tips or tweaks, you know, game suggestions, which games you like having them on, which games you like having them off, um, drop all those tips down in the comments because it'll be pretty cool to see uh, what people are playing and what kind of games um, people are enjoying with uh, the added frame rate and the added latency of uh, frame generation. That's pretty much it for today. Um, thanks for watching and until next time.